So yeah, okay. That's the way I approach this. I mean, I, I personally think the top-down approach is nonsense. It's failed for about ten thousand years. So I don't know why it's going to work today. And I and I believe honestly that um, that anything we do to make things better is going to have to go from the bottom up. So well. Or at least laterally, from side to side. Well, there has to be a level playing field, for sure. And, yeah, yeah. And, and what we're doing, what we have been doing, and what we are doing is not working. So, um, I think maybe it's time to change the ball game. You know, I've been thinking about this whole top-down business and what everybody's talking about with patient access. And... You know, you're talking about top-down medicine, where a doctor knows all doctors. This is the case. You need to do this, and the patient just unquestioningly does it. Um, I think that that particular approach might have had some virtue in, you know, many decades ago. Uh, it may patient empowerment may have still needed to happen and it wasn't happening but the the method that approach was at least somewhat workable I mean in my own case there's twice when it was our family doctor who diagnosed me told my parents you know get her to the hospital you know uh, he made house calls get her to the hospital call the hospital and let them know you're coming uh, and I'll lock up the house when I leave and you know this is this is the guy who knew the family he knew us as you know in terms of health care he knew the family and he knew what he was dealing with and it made a certain amount of sense to just simply trust that you know Doc White or Dr. Cobb knew what they were talking about and to follow their instructions and when we got to the hospital the doctor was Dr. White or Dr. Cobb it was not some resident some intern uh, some uh, hospital who up until that moment had never laid eyes on us doctor continued to be Dr. White or Dr. Cobb so in a Something like that, I, I grant you that patient empowerment has always needed to happen. But in a setting like that, at least there was some continuity to what happened. Um, in modern medicine, where care is so um, fractured between different people, where um, medical records are obviously uh, fractured as well, their accuracy, their content. It seems to me like the old family doctor model, the top-down model, is it's dead, and modern medicine just doesn't know it yet. Well, well, let's 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 take an example. You, you talk about the, your childhood experience, but what would happen today if you had a medical emergency? Emergency. I mean, I was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer in 2009, and no, no, no. that to I, me I, wasn't an, was. No, I'm talking. You're about, talking about an emergency room. Where you're critically ill. Let's say you had a. Well, I don't know. Let's let's just say. Let's let, let's not... take me for an example. All right. Let's say I. Okay. Fell down, and. Broke my hip. Right. Or I couldn't get up. Okay, I knew I broke something. What would I do? I would go to the emergency room. If you could drag yourself to your phone, you'd wind up calling the emergency, the ambulance, 911. They'd send an ambulance, 
you'd wind up going to a hospital, to emergency room, where visited and looked at uh, by interns, residents, and finally, ultimately, hopefully, an attending. And uh, decisions would be made, uh, you, you know, with your quote unquote consent about and uh, uh, operated on to take care. You know, you'd be imaged to find out exactly what was wrong. You'd be operated on to fix whatever it was and set bones. Up in the hospital for a certain number of days to you know make sure that you were on the road to recovery. The you know, when you were in the hospital bed, you'd have a different set of doctors than the ones you had when you entered in the emergency department. Yeah, so basically that, that model is not that. It depends, on, it depends on what kind of problem you have. So, the, I, and I think that the bigger issue is that we don't have a reliable model that works for everybody all the time. It doesn't work 24-7. Okay. You, you may or may right. not have a reliable primary physician who could, who may or may not go to the emergency room with you and may or may not take care of you in the hospital. All of those things are possible, but are they likely? Not really. They're possible. So I think the problem is... Today they're not likely. Pardon me? Today they're not likely. Pardon me? Right. And, and, and so the problem, again, is do you really have faith in what's going to happen? Do you have faith and trust in what's going to happen when you, when you do have to go to the hospital? Me personally, yeah. I do not. Okay. Do and you, do it you, is justified. Part of, part of that lack of faith is justified just by, you know, what we've been discussing on the listserv, the business of medicine. Um, part of that lack of faith, because of that, and a significant piece of the lack of faith, in my case, is based on the fact that I have medical PTSD. And if I enter into any uh, medical setting where I'm on your turf, uh, I am immediately at heightened, um, I'm on guard, and I'm heightened alert, and, you know, looking for anything that could go wrong that I can stop before it hurts me. That, would that be terrified? I would be a, a mild word for it, yeah. Yeah, so in other I mean, words, terrified to the point of, terrified to the point of hysteria. Yeah, so terrified to to the extent that you really can't participate. Uh, when I get to that point, yes. If I can stop myself before I get to that point, um, um, I can participate. But with hysteria... Um, I, I really, I can't participate. We simply have to wait until I can calm down so that I can think logically again. Is that something that uh, started in childhood or adulthood? Well, it started, I was twice in a row, long story short, twice in a row when I was a child. Uh, the second time I was in isolation for six weeks. And always treated very well. Uh, to make another long story brief. So I emerged with a lot of mistrust and fear. Uh, when I was a child, I can see uh, where it manifested itself in various things that I did. As an adult, all through my life, I've had nightmares. Uh, the same, the same theme, and I often wake up crying, total, and my heart racing, breathing heavy, crying, uh, 
you know, and, and it was the same nightmare all the time. Uh, and I couldn't figure out why I had these nightmares. Well, now I know. Um, it's affected me my entire adult life. This ha I'm 62 now. This happened when I was five. So, yeah, it's affected my whole life. When I am responsible for my own medical decisions and care, um, it certainly, uh, in, in encounters, it made uh, a difference in what happened in decisions that I was able to make, in actions that I was able to take. It's okay. So, uh, if we fast forward, how did you get okay. to a Society for Participatory Medicine? Because um, I need to have an upper endoscopy. This is the procedure that my primary care provider had suggested a couple of years ago, and I said, no, no, I can't do this. <clears throat> she, she suggested it again a couple of years after that, and by that time, my symptoms were severe enough that I was really in pain. And I knew I needed to do something, but I couldn't. I couldn't count it as you're done. I wound up, as they say, <laughs> in her for two hours. And uh, I now realize, at the time I didn't realize, I was just trying to keep my emotional nose above water, that I now realize that they basically closed the whole clinic down while I was having my breakdown. And this is a busy little clinic uh, with you know people moving around all the time. There, When I left at, at the end of two hours, there was no movement in that clinic. The nurses were at their station, and they looked at me really wide-eyed as I left and said, I hoped I feel better. Then I went to the check out to pay my copay, and the gal just, you know, all the office staff at the front desk had even wider eyes, and they just waved me on and said, don't worry about it, you know, just, we hope you feel better. There were, like, two people in the waiting room, and I think that they actually called in, what, police, men in white coats, a SWAT team, I don't know, I don't know who they called in. I think they cleared the clinic except for essential personnel, and um, called in uh, crisis workers so that if I became out of control and a harm to myself or others, they could intervene. How bad it was. I eventually, after about three years of, of working very closely with the psychiatrist on these issues of medical PTSD, I was able to get myself to a place where I thought perhaps I could do it. I went to talk to a GI specialist, uh, Ryan Memnick at UNC Hospitals, and by this time I am very accustomed to doctors thinking that I'm a pain in the behind. Uh, they tend to appreciate or enjoy working with me. Um, they think that I'm really bad because I have trouble with my emotional responses to some medical things, a character flaw. So I'm used to doctors not particularly liking me. I tried to Dr. Madnick what my issues were and how intense they were. And I said I need to have you talked about. <clears throat> but the first order of the owner re-traumatized the patient. So already traumatized enough. So we have to figure out a way to do this that is not uh, 
going to make all the trauma worse. And he listened to me at length. He took me seriously. He believed me. He believed what I said. He took it seriously. And uh, he is the one who referred me. To, he, he, you know, we, we talked for an hour and a half about uh, the need for doctors to listen to patients, to believe them, to work with them. And I left his office feeling very confident. If he had said, at the end of about an hour, talk to Dad, let's just do this right now, get this over with, you know. It's just, we need to do it, let's just get it over with. I would have said, okay, sure, let's do it. He's the one who referred me to society. And in terms of his ability to deal with someone like me who is a quote-unquote difficult patient, he's marvelous. He's been great. And that's how I found this society. So you found a reliable physician partner. Yes. Someone who could partner with me at a level that I needed medical PTSD. Well, the interesting thing is that it really doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. You need somebody who can listen. I think that's the key word. Who listens and understands. I've had... My first oncologist was... He, he, he listened, kind of. But it just... He totally was unable to understand what was going on and, and to react appropriately accordingly. So listening... Uh, and, and, and understanding and being able to react appropriately on that basis. So, yeah, so, but listening, assume, assuming that they have competence, then they're going to understand if they listen. So, so I think that's a level of competence that you're talking about. And maybe, maybe, maybe confidence maybe. as well. Not not feeling threatened by you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, my first oncologist would listen to me. I mean, he spent a good amount of time with every visit. I mean, he would listen to me. But his response to everything was always to diminish my fears, to diminish my worries, to poo-poo them. Dismiss, you mean? And, uh, yeah. And I know that he being reassuring and, you know, and, you know, presenting a picture of somebody who was confident in the face of this frightening diagnosis. I know that in his mind, that's what he was doing. But the way he was coming across to me was he was saying, oh, what you're experiencing, what you're thinking, that's not real. That's not important. You know, here's the real thing. You just leave. Um, uh, let me take care of it. Uh, you know, worried about is easily handled. And then that was all he'd say about it. And I found that very nice and dismissive. And, I mean, he had a heart of gold. He meant well, but I fired him. Yeah, well, I mean, he, yes, hearing and listening and understanding, I guess, are all different things. Now, you and I have talked before about the characteristics of a reliable physician partner, and I think we're, we're talking about those things right now, the things that made you feel comfortable and really eliminated your fear. Well, didn't eliminate it. Because it made it manageable. I talked to Dr. Madnick. I went out to my car and proceeded to start to have a wild panic attack again and ended up crying for two days. Uh, but while I was with him, I was good. So, um, it, you know, it's... And that says nothing about Dr. Madnick. It just says that that's the nature of the pathology that I have. Yeah, so you had a delayed meltdown, and it lasted for two days. Yeah. 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 
That does not sound like fun. It's not. It is exhausting. It's not just exhausting. It's physically exhausting. Once the intent of the anxiety has passed, uh, I am physically exhausted and drained. Uh, I don't want to move. I can't think. I can barely function. Two weeks for those physiological effects to wear off. Well, I'm sure you have uh, having a major depleted uh, many of your yeah. neurotransmitters a major and, and your your catecholamine yeah. levels probably drop and your cortisol levels are probably flying and then coming back down Sky to high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So so it's not like talking to Dr. Mabnick eliminated my fear. It didn't eliminate it. Uh, it made it as manageable as it can be at this particular point in time. It made me feel like I had somebody who was thoroughly on my side. Uh, and then after I talked to him, I asked for some special considerations when it came to the procedure, and he worked for three months with the powers that be to get approval for these things, you know, that, that I wanted to get them to happen. And and in the end, one of them he was able to get. The other thing he was not able to get. And I thought, you know, this man. His PA, these two people have worked hard to try what I say would make me feel comfortable. Uh, they couldn't do it, totally. The very fact that they have worked so hard to, to get me exactly what I asked for, and they haven't complained, they haven't moaned, they haven't said, you know, gee, are you sure you really need this? They just accepted my particular psychological problem with the PTS and said, this is what we need to help our patients. And they tried very hard to get it. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to be who I can trust to have my welfare at heart any more than these people. Look at how already fought for me. Based not on my diagnosis, based on the standard of care for my diagnosis, based on me, based on my personality and what I said I needed. Do these people listen? It matters to them what I say. They're trying to give me what I say I need. If I can't trust to do this procedure with my best interests totally at heart, um, th th I can't trust. Th I'll never find anybody that I can trust anymore. So I did have the procedure. It was, it was difficult. I did it. Uh, the people, uh, the anesthesiologist, the support staff in the GI clinic, uh, Dr. Madnick, I mean, everybody was just very understanding, very caring. It was, if I had to do it again and I had those same people, I could probably do it. So... If I understand correctly, you got to Society for Participatory Medicine through them, through that position? Yeah, so the one who referred me to ePatient Dave and to the Society for, Particip for Participatory Medicine. Okay. Uh, he's the one who pointed me in this direction. And now that's your, that was your gastroenterologist? Yes. Okay. So what does Society for Participatory Medicine do for you? Well, you know, to be honest with you, at this point, I'm not sure. 
I find that most of the discussion in the society is about the administrative matters, uh, uh, particularly electronic health records and whether patients have access to them or not. In my particular case, that hasn't been much of an issue. I have gotten all, all of my care through the UNC Health. Uh, so getting my health records is not a big deal. I know how to do it. I go to the same place to do it whenever I feel like I want something. I've got copies of all the imaging that I've done, not just the reports, but the actual images. Um, I know how to do it, and I go and get them, and I save them uh, against future need. And um, the whole thing about health records and how we pass them on and all of this, the only thing that my only issue is when I look at my records, I find inaccuracies in sometimes. But that's my only issue with the records. For the society members, it seems like it's a lot more. Where are the records? How easy is it to get them? Do you know how to get them? How much do you have to fight to get them? Those are non-issues for me. So what would... Um... To me... What would be yes? helpful to you? For me, the participatory part, participatory medicine, is improving doctors' abilities to listen to and take patients seriously. Um, especially if you've got a difficult patient. Uh, you know, it's easy to listen to and take seriously an easy patient. Difficult, something's going on. And you need to be able to figure out and, and work with, with that. If, if the patient really needs care, I just, I feel, I feel that my innovation is not, can I get a hold of my medical records? Oh, of course I can. Not a big deal. My issue with participation is, Will my doctor listen to me? Will they take me seriously? Will they patronize me and say, oh, that's easily handled, and then brush on past the concerns that I've raised? Um, issue with participatory is more interpersonal, whereas the society so far, as far as I can see, crushes on the list, the issues tend to be more procedure, business of medicine process oriented. So if you were, I think that brings us back to our, to the conversation we had before about characteristics of an ideal physician partner. Um, it sounds like that's right. your focus, really. Um, and and for you, it sounds as if listening, understanding, um, I want my physician to be able to vicariously put themselves in my place and see the world as I see it, see the way I see it. Put aside your medical training. Put aside what you know for just a minute. And see everything the way it looks from where I'm sitting. And, and you know, then, you know, and let me know that you see it. You want to know one of the most effective uh I had two extremely effective physician encounters when I had cancer. One of them was with a radiation oncologist, and one of them was with a medical student. And, and they were they were what I would consider ideal encounters. Do you want to describe them? Sure. The 
first one came when I was hospitalized for febrile neutropenia on the eighth day after my first chemo. Uh, my blood, my white counts tanked, and I had to be hospitalized. And um, a group of, I, I was put in a room by myself at infection risk. And this whole group of people in white coats come into my room. One person is introduced to me as the person who's going to be taking my medical history. Well, I come to find out, you know, she was a medical student. I'm probably a fourth year medical student. Um, and uh, she, she would talk to me every day. She talked to me that first day, and I told her what I've told all my doctors when I had cancer. Cancer at 100 out of 100. I'm afraid of you at 99 out of 100. Cancer wins, but not by very much. And I want you to know this. And I told her the same thing. I, you know, told her what I knew at the time about my childhood hospitalizations. And, you know, I'm sorry. It's, you know, it's nothing personal. Uh, it's just, this is how I feel in medical settings. So I was in the hospital for about three days, and every day she'd come in once or twice a day and chat with me. And on that third day, she came in and said it was in early in the morning. She was doing the preliminary rounds. And she came in and sat at the, the bed. She was probably dead. She started crying. She says, what can I do to help you not be so afraid? I mean, I hadn't slept for three days. I was on high alert. Uh, I was on high alert against potential danger. Um, so, you know, I mean, all of this was in my chart. It was very clear that having a rough time just from the cycle of and she burst into tears too, to help you not be and I burst into tears too and there's anything you can do but we spent a long time uh, uh, probably 45 minutes uh, out what it's like I, I think I asked her at some point and I said so you're in medical school I said what why do you want to do this? And I had had a, a intubation at that, about two nights before. And so we talked about intubation. And she was describing what it was like for her to be taught how to intubate. And I was just listening to her talk about learning medicine. And she was so in love with what she was learning of with the field. And she cared enough about me, upset, she could see that I was upset. We were both upset about the same thing, but she was coming at it from the other direction. You know, I was coming at it from my direction, she was coming at it from hers, but we were both upset about the same thing. She cared enough that she really wanted to help me, she couldn't figure out how to do it. And I thought... We had to be into that. I mean, mind you, two nights earlier, I had a major meltdown when some careless resident tossed over her shoulder as she was leaving my room late one night. Oh, by the way, how do you feel about intubation? Versus that night had to mop up the problem, problem she had caused. So, you know, a day and a half later, I'm sitting with this fourth-year medical student we're crying together, and she's telling me what it was like to learn how to intubate. And when she was done talking, I thought, you know, if I had to be intubated right now, I would want her to do it. And I know that sounds silly because she's just a fourth-year medical student. She has almost no experience. But it was just the idea that she cared. She cared about me. And she loved what she was doing so much. That was one experience. 
the other experience was with my radiation oncologist. I was bulking. I had to have all of my lymph nodes removed on the breast cancer side body. And I was balking at the idea that my doctors couldn't promise me that they were going to cure me of cancer, but they could present a really good chance that taking my lymph nodes was going to give me yet another hope. Lymphedema. Just, just every time I raised the issue, he just he'd say, "Oh well, that's easily handled." And I began to think, "Yeah, bozo, you don't have it. You live with it for a few years. You tell me how easy it is to handle, and then maybe I'll actually believe." That was his response consistently. I went to talk to the radiation oncologist about her plans for what we were going to do with radiation. She. Uh, has multiple I did not know at the time. She walks funny. She walked funny. And it had a funny mate. And she wore these uh, outrageous shoes and outrageous socks, which she had to wear practical shoes because of her walking difficulties. She didn't dress. Her. You know, she was very quirky. She came in, and I realized that this was the radiation oncologist. I understand that uh, you've got uh, a problem with the, the surgery. That you and I said, you're damn right I do. You know, you guys are supposed to be curing me. You're not supposed to be giving me other health conditions to worry about. Uh, you know, what happened to, you know, first do no harm. She said, she said, well, I understand, you know, your, your feelings about that. She says, I some of the side effects of the, of the treatments that, that I have to take for MS, which is the first that I knew that she had MS. And I looked at her, and I says, okay, do the treatments that you take for MS cause you to have other health conditions besides the MS that you now have to work with and keep track of? So you've got EMS and this other health by the treatments that you have had. And she looked me right back at me. And she said, no, you do not. And I thought, okay, she gets it. She understands the nature of my uh, objection. Just miss me and say, oh, well, it's easily handled. The yeah, lymphedema is easily handled. Uh, she's not just missing it. She's saying, yeah, it sucks. It would suck, you know, it would suck if, if my, my treatment has caused side effects but no long-term health issues. It would suck. I, I understand. It sucks. From that point... She and I were able to go on, and we talked about me having, you know, all of my lymph nodes removed. We looked at the images. We looked at the nodes. We talked about what if we only did some? What if we did all? What about radiation, you know, to instead? And she explained that radiation could also cause lymphedema, the effects of, of the, the burning of and so I just, I got to have a real nice, rational conversation with her, and it started with her just frankly acknowledging, you know, yes, I understand the nature of objection. No, my treatments for MS are not like that. I understand it. And you're right. It's, it's not the same. And I, I, I get it. And I thought, oh, okay, she gets it. Well, so now we can go on and talk about this thing that I was refusing to, to do. Those were the two times when I felt like, oh, my God, listening and they under and appreciate the point of view that I'm bringing to this. That, sounds, that doesn't mean they agreed with it. Sounds like empathy. Just appreciated it and Yes, they were able to see the world as I saw it, the medical world, as I was seeing it, and 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 acknowledge that as, as valid and real. You know, and then we all say, but, 
collaboration with the cancer, so what are we going to do about it? You know, and and those were two extremely good times. I mean, if I won the lottery, I would. I don't know who that fourth year medical student was. I don't. But I would go back. I would. So I found out who she was. I would find out where she was practicing, and I would pay off her student loans. I mean, I just, I could be a remarkable doctor. Now, she was embarrassed. She was embarrassed cried like that. I thought it was the most caring body had done for me yet. So, you, basically, you're talking about empathy and care and compassion. And understanding, yep. I don't hear anything about competence. I'm assuming competence. Ah. I get, yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. I, I, I'm not highlighting competence. And in, uh, I, when it comes to aspects of the practice of medicine, I'm assuming competence. I'm assuming that that's there. It's all the other stuff that I'm looking for. You're right. It hadn't occurred to me, but you're absolutely correct. I assume the competence is there until I have reason. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't question. If, I mean, I question the drugs that the medical oncologist was planning to give me uh, in the past. I've had doctors tell me, you need to take this drug, and I've gone and looked it up, and before I filled the prescription, uh, I'd call the doctor back and say, why? According to what I can read in the physician's desk reference, you know, I fit the profile of somebody that shouldn't be taking this drug. Why did you prescribe it for me? And he gave me a reason, and okay, that makes sense to me, and I went ahead and filled the drug and filled the prescription and took it. So I do question, and I will question. I mean, there was one time when my son my younger son was eight months old and in the hospital in an oxygen tent crew. And they had been giving him a certain color of medicine, liquid medicine. And the nurse came in one time and the name out was a different color. And I questioned her competence then. Uh, you know, I called, called to her attention. I said, did the doctor order something else? Because this doesn't look like the stuff you've been giving him. She stopped, she went and checked, and when she came back, she had the original. So, yes, I will question competence. I will question competence, but I don't assume, I don't know. I guess maybe just questioning it means that I do assume that they may be incompetent. I don't know. Well, uh, what do you think? It sounds as if you had a bad experience that led you to have essentially a violation of it's a violation of your faith and trust and some other yes. bad experiences and then so the most important thing is for you to have first of all established a trusting relationship which is which yes. assumes competence but also requires demonstration of empathy and compassion an understanding of your of you as a person so exactly that would be called that's what I would call personalized medicine and only the masters whether they're students or not they have to be a master to be able to give people what they really want um, and need it's that's the art of medicine and um, you, you know, you don't hear people talking about that much these days, but that's really what you're talking about. Yes, yes, I'm talking about the art of medicine. I'm assuming that you know the technical pieces are more or less in place. But I will say, with cancer, made me realize that doctors have a lot of trouble getting their into my space 
uh, they have a lot of trouble understanding where I'm, why I'm actually trying to write a book now about medical PTSD. I'm hoping that it might help a few people somewhere, maybe one day. But I also realized that I did not understand their world either. I did not understand the world of medicine. I did not understand what it was like to train to be a doctor, to have a practice, to be a anesthesiologist. I, you know, I didn't even know what those were. I mean, I knew the words, but I had no idea how they related to the structure of how medicine is learned. And I thought, okay, well, I, they are not coming into my world. But I, on the other hand, am not fully cognizant of their world either. So I began a self-education program. Uh, and reading autobiographies from doctors about medical school, about visits, about being an ER doc, and just the whole range. If, if a doctor has written an autobiography about his experiences as a doctor, uh, I've, I've tried to kind of find it in a number of them to, to where I understand better what it's like to be you. And uh, one of the things that impresses me is that I seem to require a great deal of emotional investment from a physician to empathize with me, understand, help me. But if and to give that kind of attention to every single patient when they've got 15 to 20 therapy bend with the patient, uh, it would be exhausting, emotionally exhausting have to do that constantly. And I don't know what the answer is. I see the need from my end, and my need is very, very real. But I also see the limiting factor from the point of view of you guys who practice medicine. The factor of time. Because it takes time to do this. And there's a limiting There's also the limiting factor of just how much do you have to invest in every single patient that you see every day? And I don't know what the answer is, but I do understand that there's, there's a disconnect to make it connect. If it, I don't know how to make it connect well for either side in this. Well, the question is... <clears throat> I think if you look at it, if you look at it from the business point of view, if you look at it as the business of medicine, which you didn't talk about, as one of the factors, and right. one of the things that you you're learning about, but I think you're learning about the business of medicine now as well. Right. Uh, right. There is no yes. one, no one would pay for that care. That's what you, what the care you need. Right. No one will pay for it. Oh, yeah. Now, oh, of course, exactly. you could pay for it, but the other thing, option is that it comes out of the physician's hide. Which is, means yeah. that everybody else is paying for it. And that's right. the reality. The, rea the reality is that that time is the most valuable... Uh, investment that the physician can give you it's more important than anything else and it's and it's the most valuable in terms of in terms of yeah but it's not compensated hmm? no and no no you, it's, your workload there's no way that it's compensated but the thing is that if this if the business were designed properly then 
it probably would be adequately compensated because it kind of comes out in the wash, you know? Um, the way the yeah. business is designed to actually, it's really designed more toward compensating people for technical and really for codes. You get compensated for codes, not for being a person. So exactly. Not for being a person who's healthy exactly. or someone who has a good outcome. So I think if you realize that the business is not designed to take care of people, it's designed to take care of codes, then you begin to understand the business of yep. medicine. So, yeah, yeah, I'm understanding that listening to all of you guys talk to me and last. I'm, I'm realizing uh, that's a piece of the picture that is about what it's like to practice medicine, a piece of the picture that I'm getting about. Yeah, and and it's and it's it's a serious problem because it leaves probably ninety five percent of the people out, not just the point one percent like you who have right. special right. Uh, issues to deal with, but it li literally leaves ninety five yeah. percent of the people out most of the time. So uh, it's not a good design when you're talking about people. And the other um, issue that comes up is. It, with SPM, um, I guess you're learning by being a member of SPM, but what are you bringing to SPM? I think you bring some things to SPM. So, what do you think you bring? To I actually doubt that I bring that much, uh, truly. Uh, I, I bring questions. I bring the occasional, yeah, but... Uh, but in in, to, in the general direction of the conversations that I'm in SPM have gone, I feel like I have very little to contribute, but I do learn by listening. Uh, occasionally, if I have a comment to make, then I will, you know, I will pipe up. I think I'm bringing a great deal, and unless and until the conversation shifts to not the business of medicine, not the technical aspects of providing care, but when you're talking about the doctor-patient relationship, the emotional, the art of medicine, that's where I feel experiences and some well, which I voice all too readily, I'm afraid. Well, I, I tell you, I'd like to, as I suggested earlier, I'd like to follow up with you and see if we can't um, outline more about what you think the ideal characteristics are uh, of, of a reliable physician partner. I'd like, to, I'd like to attack that with you a little bit and talk more about the art of medicine. I think those are very important things and maybe, you know, lacking from the list. As you said, I think a lot of people limit their understanding of health and health care to the technological part, and that's really 0.01% of the big picture. So I appreciate your point of view, and I think um, we need to talk some more. Um, I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to add that to this interview because it would just go on and on. Um, but right. Uh, I I think it's it's very important and neglected, and so I think we should take it on and and see if we can't get back there. I know you. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but if you look at the newsletter, you'll see that. Um, some of the interviews may uh, point to that discussion, uh, particularly the interview with um, Steve Driscoll, the, the psychologist. Okay. You might want to take a look at that because that'll, okay. that'll help us, I think, um, for our uh, future discussions. And, and I think we, we kind of dropped that. You and I dropped it. And... 
I still believe it's important. Yeah, yeah. To, it's important that we follow up on it and that we uh, actually try to try to make that list because it's educational for the physicians. So right now they're being pushed to produce. Their value is in how much money they can generate for the people they work for, which is stupid and it's wrong, but that's the way it is. So I think it's right. important to push in the other direction about what people really need. And part of that is reliable physician partners. And it's extremely difficult to work in the business of medicine and be a reliable partner because the extra time and attention... Yeah, the extra time and attention you need to give people comes out of your hide, your hide, physician hide, yep. and and not yep. too many people are that dedicated these days. So, they there needs to be more of an well, effort. I try. Yeah, I don't think of it just in terms of the physician hide, but in terms of their dollars and cents productivity. I think of it in terms of their psycho being, um, uh, you know, d d the, the consequence being that I've become at this the point where if I don't have issues that are likely to be triggers for me and I don't have a lot of need for a lot of the hand-holding and, and the emotional engagement, I try to make my encounters with my physicians, you know, short, sweet, and to the point, so that they can get in and out with me and move on to somebody and maybe have, you know, get five extra stolen from my visit because I didn't need it because some other patient that they have that day may need the extra time. Uh, so let them spend their time on somebody who needs more care than I do that day. But uh, I think what's, it's hard to do. what's important is that we begin the conversation that begins to push on the people in administrative circles to change the direction from seeking profit to good outcomes. And the way I look at it is very yeah. simple. You're, you're a very sensitive patient, but most people are not getting what they need. So you're not the only one. You yeah. may react in a different way, but you're certainly not the only right. one that is uh, is yeah. Un yeah. uncomfortable and unhappy. In fact, 100% of the people I talk to, patients and families, are unhappy with the way they're treated by the business of medicine. So uh, I, I, I don't think this is a trivial issue, and I do think it requires a lot of pushing from the patient side if we're going to fix it so oh yeah i agree i agree i think the patients are the ones who are going to be able to make the biggest change because they're they're the people whose lives are directly impacted whatever the business of medicine chooses to do or not do right so i think you know we live and die by, by what big venison chooses to do or not do for us via the physicians that they fund and direct. Well, they don't fund them. You see, that's the point. They don't fund them to care. Well, that's true. It's they, patient funding. They don't fund them. Especially the insurance companies. They do not pay for yeah. people, for physicians to take care of patients. They pay for physicians right. to run them through the mill. And that's what the problem is. Right. So anyway, the bottom line is, yep. I think you and I need to, uh, I think the opportunity is to focus on what the characteristics are of the ideal physician partner. And then the next step is to push the, for the provider organizations to give physicians the time and support they need to do their job, which includes taking care of patients, even if it takes extra time. So, I mean, that's just part of the deal. Yes. And and if and if so far, yeah. they're not really doing that. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity, and we just need to, to keep pushing. Yeah.
So you need to let me know you know how I can help you. I think you I'm I'm going to basically the interview is done, but I just wanted to have that conversation with you before we um before I, I stop with you today, you know.